thinking better and thinking together about life's most important issues. A place to finally meet in the middle, to think freely and reasonably about the big questions of life. This is Thinker Sensitive. Welcome to another episode of Thinker Sensitive. We are continuing our three-part mini-series on cancel culture and public education. Last episode, we evaluated cancel culture from a philosophical and ethical perspective. And on today's episode, we're going to take a look at public education. So let's jump right in. Sometimes a big sporting event takes place at a neutral venue. This is to ensure that neither team is given an unfair advantage, since home crowds can have a huge impact on the outcome of a game. In college basketball, preseason tournaments, conference tournaments, and the tournament, March Madness, all take place at neutral arenas. In college football, some of the early season non-conference games occur on neutral fields as well as the annual Red River Showdown between Texas and Oklahoma, the yearly Florida-Georgia matchup, which takes place in Jacksonville, all the bowl games, and of course the college football playoff and the championship game. Outside of college athletics, the Super Bowl, which rotates or cycles through different host cities, is the most famous neutral field example in professional sports. Again, Home crowds and even home fields or arenas tend to have a strong influence on the results of a contest, so playing a game at a neutral venue can allow for a more even playing field. During the Enlightenment period, many political philosophers developed and propagated the modern idea of public neutrality, that the public square should be driven by objectivity and impartiality rather than subjectivity, personal agendas, and ideologies. An example from modern democratic governments would be the notion of procedural justice in law proceedings and court cases. The idea of treating people equally before the law, especially without regard to ethnicity, or economic worth, or social status, or religious affiliation. This idea is physically represented in that familiar image of Lady Justice, who faithfully holds the scales of justice while being blindfolded. The image reflects notions of neutrality, impartiality, fairness, and objectivity. Though such modern notions and concepts are noble, though they represent ideals that public officials should strive for, Is such neutrality a realistic human possibility? Is the picture of Lady Justice an accurate portrayal of the attitudes and behaviors prevalent in the public square? Are these modern notions truly reflective of the concrete realities of public life? Are they representative of the values and priorities of public figures and public workers? including those who work in the public education system and carry the heavy responsibility of teaching the generations to come? Are these ideals not mythical in nature? Fairy tales? Pure make-believe? Fables and folklore created by fallible human beings? Is not neutrality itself a human construction? and a human impossibility. Are not all human beings biased and partial? Don't all people have agendas and ulterior motives, whether explicit or implicit, conscious or subconscious, malicious or not? On today's episode, I want to focus on the public education system which, for better or worse, is not necessarily a neutral and impartial space. Before I fully clarify my thesis statement for this episode, 
I think it would make sense for me to share some of my personal experiences from my days at community college. Experiences that I think are quite relevant to this podcast. I'll start with the bad and move towards the good. One of the worst teachers I ever had was an American history professor. He was a classic, old-fashioned educator who held tenure at the school. This guy was super dogmatic and objective. He spoke with great authority, like he was God himself. He had never been wrong in his life. He commanded the room. Free thinking and free communication were not really encouraged in his class. It was his way or the highway. He was also a staunch and vocal Democrat, an old-time left-wing lifer. That was made very clear very early on. When he talked about the history of government in the United States, or when he evaluated all of the presidents throughout the history of our nation, he literally had nothing positive to say, like not one thing, about any conservative leader. He consistently reminded us, over and over again, that all the great presidents have been Democrats, and that liberals naturally make greater presidents than conservatives. He stated these things, how can I say, as a matter of fact, not a matter of opinion. I had a sociology professor who was pretty bad as well. I remember she gave me a really high grade on my first paper. She even highlighted it in class and had me read it in front of all my classmates. Then, once she found out that I was religious, she gave me bad grades on everything else. And let's just say, I don't think that was a coincidence. I don't say this to be haughty or cocky, but simply to make my point. In my educational career, very rarely did I get a bad grade on anything. Still to this day, when I think about that experience, I do get a little upset. At the same time, I also had some really great professors in community college. Interestingly enough, in sharp contrast to my American history professor, my political science professor never gave any indication as to where he fell on the political spectrum something that I greatly respected him for, and something that I think should be the norm in public institutions. My math teacher, my science teachers, and my literature and writing teachers were also all great. So overall, I would say that I had a mixed experience in community college. Some of my professors were quite biased, some not so biased. Some of my professors taught in an unethical manner, and some taught in an ethical manner. I definitely developed a lot of important thoughts and ideas about education during that time frame, and I would like to share some of those with you today. On this episode, I want to talk about educational ethics, an ethic of education. This relates to ideals of neutrality impartiality, fairness, and objectivity in the public square. This is a topic that hits close to home, one that I'm very passionate about. I was in school till I was about 30 years old. I started taking on-campus college classes when I was 15 or 16 years old. I have four academic degrees. Up until about eight years ago, my plan was to get my PhD, and to teach philosophy and religion in college. Until it wasn't. Outside of being a student, I also have a good deal of experience teaching in a variety of different and diverse capacities. And I've learned some important things along the way. I believe that public schools should be havens of free thinking and free communication. I believe that college should be a place where students from all backgrounds and walks of life are encouraged to think through and talk through important issues in a civil and constructive manner. And I believe that the university should be one of the safest spaces in society to do just this. If free thinking, 
civil discourse and constructive dialogue can't take place within the parameters of public education, then where can these things take place? In the public education system, students should be learning how to think critically and to think for themselves, not learning how to think just like their teachers or their professors. Outside of all commonly accepted matters of objectivity, like a right angle is an angle of 90 degrees, or frogs are amphibians, and thus whenever one is dealing with a subjective or debatable topic, creative thinking and novel thinking, as long as such thinking is representative of sound thinking, should be encouraged, not discouraged. College campuses in particular should reflect a true and free marketplace of ideas, not a closed system where only certain ideas are able to be bought and sold. Before I begin to unpack my ethic of education, I probably need to hit a couple big elephants in the room. The first is that the majority of public schools, and certainly the majority of public colleges and universities, are liberal-leaning. Many of them are even far left-leaning. But don't just take my word for it. The Higher Education Research Institute at the University of California, Los Angeles, conducts a survey of full-time faculty at American four-year colleges and universities every three years. In this survey, they ask how faculty members self-identify across the political spectrum. Their 2016 to 2017 study found that 60% of faculty members identified as either far left or liberal, compared to just 12% being conservative or far right. Furthermore, a 2018 national survey conducted by Boston-based WGBH News found that overwhelmingly, Americans perceive college campuses to be partisan environments. 59% believing that they lean towards one particular political viewpoint. Of those who thought colleges lean towards a specific political viewpoint, 77% said they lean liberal. So the first elephant in the room is that most public colleges are liberal-leaning. Now, this would not be a problem at all if all professors taught in an ethical manner and lived up to the ideal of public neutrality. But that is simply not the case. And my own experience testifies to this. The problem is not with political affiliation itself. The problem is with unethical teaching practices. I don't care whether you are a liberal professor or a conservative professor. I don't even care whether a school is made up of all liberal faculty or all conservative faculty. What I care about is how topics are being taught and how ideas are being communicated in the classroom. The second elephant in the room is that most public schools and public universities, not unlike my sociology professor in community college, also have a bias against classical traditional, orthodox forms of religion. There are many reasons for this, but to try and put it in a nutshell, devout religious students tend to hold to more traditional or even conservative views on social issues and issues of morality and ethics, which are heavily discouraged and even disparaged in public education and on college campuses. Again, the problem here is not so much with negative views against religion and anti-religious bias. The problem is when educators bring these views and bring these biases into the classroom. And unfortunately, some of them do. Now, one might respond by saying, but aren't private schools just as biased, partial, and partisan, even more so. And isn't this why we have private schools in this country? 
if you are conservative leaning or a right wing parent, just send your kids to a private school. Or if you are religious, just go to a religious institution. If you are a Christian, for example, go to a Bible college or a Christian university. No one is forcing you to go to a public school. The problem is that this line of thinking overlooks the distinction between a public and private institution. Public and private schools are not and should not be held to the same ethical standards. Most of the money for public education comes from two big sources, state income taxes and property taxes. These taxes power the public education system and also power many other functions of government and of public enterprise. Public education, unlike private education, is funded by the taxpayers, by the hardworking citizens of this country, by you and me, by the people, for the people, by the masses, of all ethnicities, all religions, all genders, all political persuasions, of all backgrounds, and of all worldviews. Ethically speaking, I think this means that public schools have a moral responsibility to accurately reflect the ethnic, religious, political, cultural, and ideological diversity of this nation without clear bias, prejudice, partiality, favoritism, or partisanship. The modern notion of neutrality applies to public institutions in a way that it does not and should not apply to private institutions. Private institutions don't have an ethical or moral obligation to neutrality, at least in terms of how ideas or topics are presented and taught. A Christian university, for example, has every right to teach its students exclusively from a Christian worldview, and such universities are actually expected to do so and are designed to do so. When a student applies to BYU and enrolls in classes, that student expects partiality, not impartiality. That student, in all likelihood, isn't looking for neutrality, but is actually fully expecting to be taught, is paying tuition in order to be taught from a Mormon perspective and understanding. So there's a clear difference in terms of expectations here as well. Public schools, whether they actually are or not, should be expected to be impartial and neutral by virtue of them being public institutions and being funded by the diverse and heterogeneous general public. Whereas private schools, particularly religious institutions, are expected to be ideological in nature. Another thing to consider is that many religious people don't have the money to send their kids to private school or to attend private schools themselves, and so public schooling really becomes their only option for formal education. On top of public funding and general expectations, there are also federal laws that help make this distinction between public and private schools more clear. Laws that are designed to protect neutrality in public institutions. Let's take a look at some of these. Since we're talking a lot about religion, I want to evaluate some regulations and rulings that relate to religious practice and religious teaching in public schools. Regulations that I wholeheartedly agree with, by the way. There are some Christians who greatly lament the apparent removal of Christianity from public schools. I'm not one of them. The Supreme Court has repeatedly held that the First Amendment requires public school officials to show neither favoritism toward nor hostility against religious expression such as prayer. So we have the idea of neutrality. The Pledge of Allegiance 
including the under God statement, has been upheld in court many times, but it can't be compelled, which means participation in the pledge is voluntary in public schools. This displays an ethic of liberty that protects against force and coercion. Generally speaking, religious belief and religious practice are protected by the First Amendment in public schools. Students are free to pray at school, to read their Bibles or sacred pieces of literature during free time or in between classes, and they are free to reference their religious beliefs in assignments and class discussions. Educators are free to teach religion but are not allowed to personally endorse or advance religious belief. Here again, you see notions of impartiality. The educator is expected to remain neutral in her presentation. In 1999, several influential organizations came together, both religious and non-religious, to craft a joint statement on how religion should be taught in public schools. The document is entitled The Bible in Public Schools, A First Amendment Guide. I have found it to be quite helpful. Let me read a few key points from the statement. The school's approach to religion is academic, not devotional. The school may strive for student awareness of religions, but should not press for student acceptance of any religion. The school may sponsor study about religion, but may not sponsor the practice of religion. The school may educate about all religions, but may not promote or denigrate any religion. The Bible may be used as a primary text, although it probably should not be the only text for a course. Schools should avoid the use of instructional materials and lessons that are of a devotional nature, such as those used in Sunday school. When selecting teachers to teach Bible electives, school districts should look for teachers who have some background in the academic study of religion. Unless they have already received academic preparation, teachers selected to teach a course about the Bible should receive substantive in-service training from qualified scholars before being permitted to teach such courses. What kinds of values are being promoted here? What kind of ethic is being put forth in these statements? Is it not an educational ethic of neutrality and impartiality? Should this not be the general ethic of public education? Shouldn't this ethic be applied universally in public schools, not just in the context of teaching religion or the Bible, but in terms of teaching any belief system, worldview, or ideology? Because of public funding, general expectations, and various regulations and rulings, the answer to this question should be a resounding yes. No subjective belief, opinion, or viewpoint should be endorsed or advanced by public educators in a coercive manner, but merely presented in a truly open and free environment of learning. But is this actually the case? Is this ethic of neutrality and impartiality representative of what is actually taking place in public schools today? I don't think it is. But I think this is partially because, as I suggested in the intro, the ideal in question is humanly impossible to maintain with any consistency or universality. At the end of the day, we're all biased. I'm biased. You're biased. The teacher down the street is biased. And these biases will inevitably enter into our education practices one way or another. In public grade school education, in middle school and high school, 
The states and the districts are the ones who are primarily responsible for the establishment, selection, and regulation of curriculum, teaching methods, and instructional materials in their schools, so long as they don't breach the Constitution and violate federal regulations. For the most part, teachers, as employees, must carry out the selected curriculum and abide by any restrictions. They do not have a right to use whatever teaching materials and methodologies they choose if contrary to school policy. Teaching unions are meant to help balance the scales a bit, though. They give teachers a voice and protect their rights. They support teacher professionalism and teacher development. They help improve teacher working conditions. And they provide checks and balances to administrative power. Teachers and professors at public colleges and universities, however, have much more freedom. Let's talk about the nature of this freedom for a bit and evaluate the pros and cons of this freedom. We'll do that on our next episode. Thanks so much for listening. This episode and all episodes of Thinker Sensitive are available on thinkersensitive.com Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and more. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app today to listen to more thought-provoking content from Thinker Sensitive.